page 25 in the book Boundless, Endless Love. Let's all stand. We we'll worship Him. Give Him praise. Sing loud and smile. Good morning, church. Good morning. I got an announcement or 50 here, so uh, just hang. That just shows that we're active and doing stuff, right? Yes, yeah, so that's good. Okay. Uh, Sunday, July 31st, that's tonight, fifth Sunday night singing service. It's going to be a good time. I hate I'm going to miss it. Uh, Wednesday, August 3rd, there'll be no children's ministry. Uh, there'll be no children's ministry because right after this service, all the youth are headed to youth camp at the beach, and all of our children's ministry folks are going with us to help a chaperone. That's how we have to do things. We have to share responsibilities. So no children's ministry on August 3rd. Sunday, August 7th is VBS volunteer meeting. Uh, all volunteers need to show up. Uh, we're going to decorate the church that night, uh, and we're going to have a taco bar set up downstairs in the fellowship hall for supper. So. There'll be no night service, Sunday night, August 7th, but uh, a lot of work uh, and decorating. Wednesday night, August 10th, will be the VBS prayer night, uh, and children's ministry will be going on then. Uh, our theme this year, Concrete and Cranes, we're all just going to meet up here and pray over um, the entire church and the property and, and pray for VBS. Vacation Bible School is August 11th through August 13th, August 11th and 12th, that's a Thursday and a Friday, 6 to 8.15 p.m., Saturday night, August 13th, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, don't worry about feeding those kids, just bring them. We're going to have a full meal for them. So just, just bring in kids on over here and let's, let's have a VBS. Early registration has begun, uh, so if there's forms available online. Uh, we can get you a form if you need one. I don't understand exactly how that stuff works, but um, uh, all the folks that do have got it covered. We've got over 50 kids registered already. Wow. Over 50 kids registered. It's going to be a good time. Uh, pray for it. Pray for our, pray for those children and their families uh, that we that we're going to reach for Christ. We, you'd just be amazed how many kids are reached for Christ and then their families are reached for Christ. And it starts at a vacation Bible school at some country church somewhere. Incredible. Blue Ridge Baptist Camp meeting August 8th through 19th, 7.30 p.m. nightly. Uh, this one's way out, but Saturday, September 24th, from 4 to 7, we'll have the second annual barbecue dinner and silent auction fundraiser. The Big Level Women's Group is doing that, and all the proceeds... <laughs> Uh, go towards shipping costs for OCC shoeboxes. 
Uh, oh, you're reminded to bring shoe boxes to VBS. Um, please save shoe boxes for VBS, and after VBS, they'll be used to pack for OCC. Mm. Operation Christmas Child shoe box items needed for July. Notebook, paper, and crayons. Notebook, paper, and crayons. Pray over those boxes, too. Those things are, re are reaching kids in places we'll never see. Um, and I alluded to it a minute ago, but let me reiterate, if you're a youth, right after service, we've got a trailer down there um, that we're going to put all of our stuff in. We've got the van down there. We're loading up right after church, and we're going to get out of here. We've got a long drive down the road. Uh, we were kind of joking about it in the back. Uh, Cooper's Gap Baptist Church let us borrow their trailer. So we was kind of joking about it. Wouldn't it have been funny if we could have hooked it to the big level Baptist Church van? <laughs> right? Yeah. We've got too many people, though, going to get 12 kids going, six adults. But you know, really, that don't happen everywhere. That would, that would be unheard of in a lot of places. So we're, we're thankful that our, our churches can work together like that. Yeah. We want to open our service in prayer. Um, the altar's open if you want to come and pray around the altar. Just, the altar's always open. You don't need somebody to tell you that it's open. Uh, but we'll pray together over our service and invite God into our service. I'm going to ask Tommy Ailey if he'd pray for us. In your Baptist hymnal, page 122, in the Baptist, page 122, I know that my Redeemer liveth, as Brother Job taught us. Let's all stand as we give praise to the Lord.
Amen. Page 438 in the Baptist, 438, he lives, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He's alive and well. Remember what we heard Wednesday night, Brother Bruce Ryan. He's alive. Amen. Yeah. Hey, let's sing it. Give him praise. God's children said, Amen. Amen. Praise his is to be upon the other person that's here this morning. I pray that there's someone that don't know you, dear Lord. I pray that they come and know you before it's too late. Dear Lord, I ask you to be with our youth as they travel, dear Lord. Give them travel safe mercy, dear Lord. Be with the people who are sick or lost, dear Lord. I pray for each one of them, dear Lord. And dear Lord, you know each one of the causes here, dear Lord. The burdens that's on people's hearts, dear Lord. I just lift those burdens up to you and let you wash them all away, dear Lord. We ask this in your most heavenly and gracious name. Amen. Amen. Page 81. No. 
Everybody shake hands all over this building, wave, say God bless you. Y'all believe in the power of prayer? Uh, I, I think I do too. Are you glad you saved this morning? Amen. You know, he didn't have to do that. He did it because he loved us. If he saved you this morning, you ought to praise him for it. You know what, just let me say one more time so my kids and my grandkids can hear it. One day they're going to wheel a casket up through there and they're going to park it right here. Or maybe I'll be in a little box. I don't know. I really don't care. And you might hear somebody say, poor old Randy lost his battle with cancer. Poor old Randy lost his battle with old age. Lost something or this or that. Gave up his fight. Don't believe a word of it. I just traveled far enough to get home. Don't believe it. If you got your Bible, find Matthew chapter 21. We're going to start in verse 23. We're going to go to verse 32. That's where I'm going to preach from. While you're doing that, let me just tell you, if I can, how thankful I am for this church. The amount of money that was given to Go Easy Ministries is unbelievable for this little church. Incredible. And I don't know how to say thank you for that. All I know to do is tell you that one day there's going to be men saved. Because money was donated. This week, I graded the pad out. Stephen showed up. Stephen and Scott and Gavin, they showed up and they graded the pad out. And I got a big pad. I would put a picture up if I'd talk about it. You can go on Facebook and see it. Big pad laid out there for this thing. Y'all might think I'm a mystic. I don't know. But a year ago, we started the Facebook page for Go Easy Ministries. We took a picture off my back deck. We took the picture because the mountains are in the background and the fields are in front. And it was pretty. At the time, we were thinking the bunkhouse was going over yonder next to the barn in the edge of the woods. We got to looking and talking, and I talked with, with Jeremy and, and Rob, and we discussed it, and we looked around, and we decided to move it to another spot. So that's what we did. Stephen, Scott, and Gavin got there Thursday, I believe it was, and started looking at it. They said, you know, if we move it just a little bit this way, the grading would be a whole lot easier. So that's what we did. Staying on my back deck later that evening, I made a realization. That bunkhouse is going to sit in the center of that picture I took a year ago. I didn't know where it was going, but God did. Next up's footers and then foundations, and then we're going to build on it. And I'm excited, and I'm ready to go, and it's made part, it's made possible in part because of your donations, and I appreciate it. And more than that, your prayers I appreciate. And we're just going to keep working at it 
um, till we get it done. If you found your place in your Bible, would you stand with me and honor the reading of the Word of God? Matthew chapter 21, we're going to go 23 to 32. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto him, I also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it, from heaven or men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did ye not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as prophet. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second son and said, he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I will go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did, did, the, did the will of his father? They say unto him, the first. Jesus say unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of heaven before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time together uh, to open your word and expound upon it. We thank you for your spirit moving in this place already in the singing and the praying. And Father, we just pray that that continue. Uh, Father, please just remove self and sin from my life so I can just be a, a vocal piece for you. Um, none of this can, can come from me. If it does, it's of no good. But if it comes from you, it's holy and righteous and will not return void. So, Father, we just pray you take control of this service and this message. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. So, to understand what's happening, we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to go back to the beginning of chapter 21. And we're going to look as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Now, he's been traveling all over walking. Him and his disciples have been traveling all over walking. He comes in in Jerusalem this day riding on a little donkey. And he's received like a hero. Look at, look at verses 8 and 9 and 21. And a great and a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strewed them in the way. And the multitude that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You see, his, his reputation had spread about. People had heard about him. And so when he's coming into Jerusalem, these folks knew he was coming. And they anticipated great things. They had great expectations because Jesus was coming to their city. Can I offer to us, if we came to church every morning or every evening and expected Christ to show up here, with great expectations. Why are we not coming in the parking lot shouting, Hosanna! Praise the name of the Lord. Why are we not excited when we come to church? We should be singing his praises before we get here. It said they sung it before he got here, and then they chased after him singing it. So we could sing them as we come in, and we could praise him while he's here, and when he gets done, we're going out the door, we could be praising him, chasing after him as we leave. That's why we need to come to church. That's how we need to be worshiping him. And so we see he gets to his first stop uh, in chapter 12. You know, it's important to note, too, that um, this entry into Jerusalem leads to the cross, right? He, he's not going out of Jerusalem uh, in this visit until he visits the cross first. He knows that. That's on his mind as he comes in. 
And I find it interesting that he knows that. He knows what will take place on the cross. He, he has already experienced it because he's God. He knows. But he didn't delay coming. He didn't delay coming. He came on in. And so he comes into this welcome, and in verse 12, what's he do first when he gets to the city? Is he goes to the temple. In verse 12 and 13, it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. See what we got going on there is we've got these uh, religious elites, the high priests and the elders and the Pharisees, they've turned this into something for their gain. You had to pay your temple dues when you came in. You couldn't go into the temple without paying your dues. I'm a common man and had to pay my dues when I come to the temple. But I couldn't pay it with my money. I had to have their special money. And the same person, so I had to exchange my money. The same people that controlled how much was paid is the same people that determined what the exchange rate was. And the same people benefiting from the money. Yeah. And then you had to, you had to do certain sacrifices with these doves. And you had to have just the right dove. Any old dove won't do. You got to have the special doves. Guess who sold them? Same people. It was a den of corruption and thieves. They, were, they have turned the house of God into a way to make money and to empower them. And so let, let me just say this. Jesus Christ wouldn't tolerate that kind of corruption then in the house of God, and he ain't going to tolerate it today. He ain't gonna, we've got to be vigilant. We've got to stand guard against this type of corruption overtaking and infiltrating our church. Don't tell me it won't happen. It wouldn't take us long to look around to find it happening in other places. We've got to stand guard, and we've got to be vigilant. It's up to us to guard against that, because I'm telling you right now, you don't want to be on the other end of a Jesus cleansing. We don't want to be here when we wandered off into that spot and Jesus comes through and has to cleanse the temple. We don't want to be around for that. So Jesus pops on the scene here and he comes in and cleanses the temple and once he's done cleansing it, he goes about the work that he really came there to do to begin with. It says that, that folks came in verse 15, verse 15, verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them he healed them this is a place to come for healing the house of god's a place to come for healing this is physical healing there's spiritual healing here too this is a place to be for healing and look at what happened and the chief priests and scribes saw the saw they saw the wonderful things he did and the children crying in the temple and saying hosanna to the son of david and those religious folks it says were sore displeased they were indignant they were unhappy can i let you know a little something whenever god shows up whenever jesus shows up and starts doing his work christian folks are going to rejoice christian folks are going to praise him for what he's doing lost folks got a choice they got a choice they can react to one of two different ways they can repent and let him work a great miracle in their soul and save them, but they're going to get ugly. They're going to get real ugly. One or the other. We like to think about God as an inclusive God that brings people together, and that's all true. But if you refuse to be moved, you ain't going to be happy with him. And that's what's happening here in the temple. And, and, and so that brings us to verse 23, which is where I intended to preach from. In verse 23... Jesus has done his work for the day on that first visit, and he had left and went outside the city, and he had came back that next morning. And in verse 23, we see, And when he came into the temple, the chief priests and elders and the people came unto him, and he was teaching. And they came, and they came to him while he was teaching and said, By what authority dost thou these things, and who gave thee the authority? So he's come to the temple. All these people have come back a second day and they're sitting around the feet of Jesus while he's teaching to them and preaching to them and expounding upon the word of God. Can you imagine that? How would you like to spend some time sitting at the feet of Jesus while he teaches you and while he preaches to you? You spend all day sitting at the feet of Jesus while he's teaching and preaching. Can you imagine? 
Well, one day, Christian, you won't have to imagine. Because <laughs> one day, we're going home. We're going to take our last breath here, and we're going to end up up yonder, and he's going to be the first to greet us. And we're going to spend all eternity sitting at the feet of Jesus while he teaches and preaches to us. And we're going to spend all eternity praising him while we're there. We don't have to imagine it long. The time's coming uh, that it, it's going to be a reality, and, and we're going to be there. But I notice these, these, the chief priests and the elders, they come to him with this question about who gives you this authority? What authority you act under? Do you think they cared? They didn't care. The only authority they recognized was their own. He could have said anything he wanted to. And as long as it wasn't let me bow down to you, high priest, because my authority comes from you, they didn't want to hear it. Jesus is smart enough to know it. He knows it. He knows what, what they're doing. But I also notice in all this, now remember, Jesus is here, all these people are at his feet, and he's teaching. That's when the high priest and the elders come up, and they ask him what authority this is. They didn't ask him or, or um, they didn't jump on him about the work he was doing. They had nothing negative to say about what he was doing. They didn't put down his actions. They didn't challenge what he had done. The only thing it has, what authority you got? They couldn't because some of them people that had to be carried in yesterday walked in today to hear him preach, and they're sitting right there. And the fellow yesterday that sat outside with a cup begging money because he was blind is now looking on the face of Jesus. And they're going to stand in front of him and say, you, you can't be healing in here and you can't be doing... They ain't going to do that. They can't do that. They got no way to challenge him other than this a question of authority. And so Jesus knows what they're doing. He knows it's a trap. He knows it's a trick. He knows that there's no way that they're going to accept his answer anyway uh, in any of it because in their eyes they are the only authority. Uh, and so, here we go. Verse 24 through 26. Jesus answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I and likewise will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned within themselves, saying, if we shall say from heaven, he shall say unto us, Why did ye not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for I'll hold John as a prophet. So it's a simple question. Uh, he asked him a simple, straightforward question. Who gave John his authority? What do you think? Who did it? A simple question, and it's even multiple choice. There's an A and a B. He asked them. what they do? They reasoned together. They got in a the huddle. They huddled up and said, oh, man, what do you think? He's really got us on this one, I think. I don't know what we should say. I mean, you know, if we say this, then that's going to prove his point about who we are. We can't say that. If we say this, then all these people sitting around, they liable to flog us and take us out of here. We can't answer that question. They considered all those things, but I noticed one thing they didn't consider. The truth. They never one time considered the truth. They didn't think about what the truth really was. It was all about how their answer affected them. So I want us to consider this this morning. If they had considered the truth it would have forced them to consider their spiritual condition. They would have had to really get down where the mother meets the road. If I'm so spiritual, and John was of heaven, and he was, then what's that say about me? Because I lamb blasted him all over town. I put bad stuff on Facebook about him. I tried to degrade him. I run him down everywhere I could. Talked about how he was of not of God, and, and he was a liar. It would have forced them to consider their spiritual condition. If they had said he's from heaven, it would have forced them to, to consider their relationship with God. I mean, they're the elite, right? God sent them. God anointed them. God enthroned them. God gave them the power. 
If John also is from God, then how can I be against him? We're both from God, so how can I be against him? It would have forced them to consider their relationship with God, their spiritual relationship and their relationship with God. If they had considered both of those things, they would have been forced to repent because they're wrong. They're wrong. So they're never going to let the truth figure in. They never considered the truth. Let me offer this to us this morning. We should never shut out the truth of the Word of God. Never shut out the truth of the Word of God. The Word of God must reign supreme in every question. The Word of God must be the final say in every decision. He has given us all we need to know. Let me, let me tell you this. Sometimes I read the Bible, and I come across some stuff, and I say, man, that can't really be what it means. So I go to searching. I go to looking in my big concordance I got. And I start looking for other scripture that kind of pertains to it. I got a, a little, they call it a, what is it called? Notebook, notepad. It's a little thing. It's got an app on it. I look up scripture on there, and I can pick a word, and it'll tell me the original Greek word it come from, or the original Hebrew word it come from. And they'll give me all these definitions about what they are. And so I get that thing out, and I'm looking, well, surely that word, you know, in the Old English when the King James is translated, maybe it don't mean what it does today. You know what I figure out most of the time? The Bible says what it means. And it means what it says. And I'm coming to learn one thing. If it rubs me the wrong way, something needs to change, and it's not the Word of God. If the Word of God convicts me, it's me that's got to change. If the Word of God convicts you, it's you that's got to change. Don't be afraid of the truth of the Word of God. That's what it's there for. It's there to reprove us. It's there to convict us. And so, these guys, they figured out they lost this one. He got us on this one. So, I, I, I can see him. They don't say it in the Bible, but I can see him. They done slumped their heads, and they turn around and walk off. Let Jesus go back to what he's doing. They're going to go back to the back room and figure out some other different way to come at him. That's what they think. But Jesus wasn't done with them yet. He wasn't done with them yet. He wasn't ready for this to end. He's going to do what he does all the time, and that's expose the truth. He's going to expose the truth. So he comes at them in verse 27 and says, and, and they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. They start slumbering off. He called them back. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's consider this story. This is what he tells them. I love it when Jesus tells stories. Because sometimes I'm simple. And he tells them in a way I can understand them. And that was the point to begin with, right? So he starts in verse 28 and he says, But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. I noticed this man. I consider this man. He's a father, and he has two sons. He's a farmer, near and dear to my heart, on some vineyard. I don't grow that many grapes, but whatever. And the harvest is ready. The vines are full. Grapes hanging off the vines. They're ready. He's done the planting a while back. He's weeded them and cultivated them. He's done all that. He pruned them when the time was right. And the only thing left to do is gather the grapes. So I said, and he comes to his son and says, go work in the vineyard. It's a simple little command, a simple little request. Go to the vineyard. I noticed about this man that he didn't go hire laborers. He didn't go out to the town square and say, I'm hiring people to pick my grapes. He didn't do that. He didn't go to his servants and say, I need you, 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 go pick the grapes. He didn't even stand in front of his family and his servants and say, I need somebody to go pick the grapes. Well, somebody go pick the grapes. He didn't do that. He went to his children. He went directly to his children. 
and asked my son go today my son go today go work today in my vineyard he went to his son I think Jesus intended for this man to represent God the Father the heavenly Father the one in heaven and we are his children he has adopted us and saved us we are his children and can I submit to you that the vineyard lays outside those doors it's all around us the vineyard is in every direction from this church and we got cars that'll go 70 80 110 miles an hour and it don't take long to get to them it don't take long to get to the grapes and just like those boys in this story if we can't get ourselves out of the house we can't get up and go to the vineyard the grapes are gonna rot the grapes are rotting today they're hanging on the vine rotting today within three minutes of this building God didn't save us God didn't adopt us for us to spend one hour a week in church or even three hours a week in church now I'm not downplaying church attendance church attendance is crucial and vital to our spiritual health we need to be in church every time the doors are open I'm preaching to me too I'm preaching to me too but the work is not in here the work is out there it is vital that we get out of the house and get into the vineyard so let's look at his call <laughs> what's he say he says son go work today Son, go work today in my vineyard. It's a time-sensitive call. It is a timely call. Today. Go today. Go today and work in my vineyard. Today is the only right day to go. He said to go today. And today is the only right day. Tomorrow's too late. Tomorrow the grapes have rotted. Tomorrow the grapes have rotted and fell on the ground. Can I put it to you this way? Tomorrow the sinner's in hell. He said go today. If we don't go today, tomorrow they're in hell. That's the way we got to look at it. We don't know why he said go today. But he said today. There's a reason it's today. Go today. If we run ahead of God, because we got more time before he says go, that's the wrong time as well. If we're ahead of God, God's not in it because he's back here. We've gone up here. He's still back here. We're not working. We're not doing God's work. We're working to our own desires and our own flesh. Believe me, I'm, I'm learning this every day and for the past six, eight months. He's given me a vision of a bunkhouse with, with young men in it, knelt down praying to receive Christ. He's given me a vision of men coming in broken and coming out whole and living a productive life as upright men, as fathers, and as husbands, and maybe even a preacher or two, and that's the vision he's given me, and I, my goodness, I wish I could do it right now, but there's this detour, and that detour, and this delay, and that delay. His hand's on it. Preacher Sean preached last week, and boy, it spoke to my heart. His hand's on you when you're on the detour, too. You got to wait on God. You got to wait on God. He didn't say, go then. He didn't say wait till later. He said go today. You run ahead of him. You're doing your own work. You out there in the vineyard trying to pick a bunch of green fruit. You ever tried to pick something green? Hangs on the vine. You got to twist it. You got to pull it. And you got to try to break it. And if you ain't careful, you'll do more damage than you did good. Trying to pick that green fruit. I've been there. That works, that's the same in the garden as it is in life, as it is in, in discipleship. It's the same everywhere. I've been there. I've been knocking on the daggum hotel room door trying to wake a drunk up. You told me you'd go to church with me this morning. It's time. He was drunk when he told me. He probably don't even remember telling me. 
He ain't been in bed for 30 minutes. He only knows he's alive for about another 10, 12 hours. What am I doing? I'm out there being a moron trying to pick green fruit. Green fruit doesn't need picking. Green fruit needs nurturing. Got that one? Green fruit needs nurturing. How do you nurture some green fruit? Well, you might want to start by giving it a little water. God's going to give you some opportunities that green fruit to water it a little with his word. Mm-hmm. After you build that rapport and you're watering with that word a little bit, you get a good enough relationship, you might get the ability, the opportunity to help them weed out some bad influence. Hey, it's, it's hard to hear this when there's a thousand other opposites. Yeah, man, this is it. You give you the opportunity to weed out some bad influences. After you start getting some of those bad influences out, then maybe you get the opportunity to start pruning away some bad habits. My drunk friend can't understand the Bible while he's drunk. You've got to get over some of them bad habits. He gives us the opportunity to prune out some of them bad habits. Green fruit needs that kind of nurture, nurturing. It doesn't need picking. I'm going to tell you a little personal story, and I don't want to take up a lot of time, but it, it goes right to the point of, of what I'm trying to get to. The other day, a while back, I was involved in a conversation with a coworker. Now, this conversation started over our disagreement or our opposites of opinion or differing opinion on a current news story. And that's how it started. And I was doing my best to debate it. Debate, debate, debate. My coworker, debate, debate, debate. We don't get anywhere. We just, you know, run off the mouth, wasting company time. That's all he's doing. And then all of a sudden it turned. And this coworker started sharing with me an experience from their past. Described it in great detail. It was painful. Heart wrenching. Agonizing. Recounting of what happened in their life earlier in life when they were younger. And the tears started flowing. The pain was obvious on my coworker's face. I started crying. There we both sat. We were debating in button heads a few minutes ago. Now we're just blubbering like a bunch of babies as this story is recounted in great detail. And it became obvious to me that that pain hadn't been put in the past. That pain couldn't be let go of. And it had developed into shame and regret today. And I said something really stupid. You've got to find a way to get past that shame. You got to find a way to get a million dollars. You got to find a way to get in your car. You got to find a way to get in your house. The reply was, I wish I knew how. It was about then, as we were wiping tears away and thought the conversation was over, that the Holy Spirit just sat down in my heart a little bit and said, Just, just hold up a minute. Just hold up a minute. And what came to me was Romans 8 28. And, and so I told my friend, I said, listen, I don't have all the answers. I obviously can't go back in the past. Neither one of us can go back and change what happened. And I am so, so sorry that it happened. It hurts me that it happened. I would change it if I could, but I can't. But I try to trust God. I try to trust God every day. I try to live by faith every day. And what comes to me in this moment is Romans 8, 28. And I didn't go get my Bible and pull it out. So I just remembered what I could. And I said, Romans 8, 28 promises that, that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord who are called according to his purpose. That's what it says. And I said, I believe it. I believe it. With all my heart and soul, I believe it. It's the truth. It's in the Bible. It's as true then, today as it was then. It's true. And I don't know how, dear friend. I don't know. 
but somehow that kind of stuff you just described to me if you love God and you're called to his purpose it's going to work together with a bunch of stuff for good you don't have to hang on to it you don't have to feel this shame anymore about it and she's and my coworker said thank you I appreciate it later told Gretchen I should talk to him more he makes me feel better But I just watered her a little. Watered that coworker with, with the word a little. And one day, one day, I hope and I pray that I'm going to get, hey, you remember we was talking the other day? Yep. What's it mean called according to his purpose? What's it mean? And I get to say, well, you know, we were all born sinners. All of us. We got a sin debt the minute we were born. And, and we can't do nothing about it. We have no ability to wipe away our sin. We've got no ability to get shed of our sin. And, the, and, 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 and what's even worse is the penalty for it's death. It's going to kill us. Our sin's going to kill us, and we've got no way to get, get rid of it. But that same Bible that was talking in Romans 8 also says that God loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us while we were yet sinners, and he sent his son Jesus. And as Jesus came to this earth and lived among us for about 32 years and never sinned. He was all about doing his father's work. And one day he took all of our sins on him voluntarily and they hung him on a cross and they killed him. And then three days later he got up. And today he's alive. And when he got up after those three days... He had destroyed sin. Sin has no more power over me, no more power over anybody. We are freed from the power of sin. But those that are called according to his purpose are the ones that accepted the gift. Those are the ones he came to. Those are the ones he convicted and received him and recognized him as Lord and recognized Jesus for who he is and said, please take over my life and come into me. I'm tired of doing this by myself. I can't handle the shame and guilt no more. Come free me. And maybe on that day, I might get to pick a little ripe fruit. How about that? I done lost my place now. I've been talking too much. But if I had gone with this instead and said, well, you know what it says in Romans 6, 7, and 8? says if you sow to the flesh you'll reap from the flesh how's that reaping going for you is that sowing worth it how are you getting over that reaping and I could have blasted them with some self righteous condemnation the scripture is true it's still there Christian he'll forgive you with his grace but there's a price to pay for your sin if I had done that I'd never get another opportunity you can't pick green fruit. You got to nurture green fruit. You got to nurture green fruit. And so then we come to this to this first son. And this first son is receiving a personal call from his father. He comes to him and 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 the father comes to him and says, "Son." It's personal. It's directed to him. He's calling his son to go do his work in the vineyard. The Heavenly Father's calling us today too. And it's time we get busy in the vineyard. It's time that we go. But this first son, he's defiant. You see it? He said, verse 29, He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented and went. So the first time the Father comes to him with his directive to go to the vineyard today, wasn't a suggestion. It wasn't, I wish you would. He said, go today. And, and the son's first reaction is, no, nah, I'm not going. I'm not going to do it. But I'm glad this verse didn't stop there. It, it says, but afterward he repented and went. I think what Jesus is trying to teach us here is, is, is once we've realized our sin against God, there's only one correct response. 
There's only one, and it's twofold. The first one is we must confess it. We got to get before faith, on our face before God and confess our sin, ask Him to forgive us. We must repent. And we got to be honest and specific about it. You ever heard anybody say, oh, God, please forgive me my sins? All my sins. Forgive me for all my sins. God knows what all your sins are. I think he likes to hear you say it. I think he likes to say, Father, when you told me to go, and I said no because I was stubborn, and I had something else to do that day, and I'm sorry that I put that thing over you and made it my God. Whoops. Is that true? If you put it above God, it is God to you. I'm sorry that I was stubborn and rebellious, and I'm sorry that I put that thing before you and made it my God that day. Father, please forgive me of that sin. That's what God wants to hear. He wants it to be personal. He wants it to be specific. And then once you've done that, you've got to change course. I'm sorry I did that today, and then you do it again tomorrow. The Xbox. I just couldn't get off the Xbox to go out of the house today, God. I don't know, maybe tomorrow. Well, that Call of Duty thing was going on. I don't even know what that is, but I hear it a lot. No, I can't. I can't. I can't get out. My job. My work. That TV show that comes on. Good grief! Put a TV show in front of God. Holy smokes! You got to change course. There's no true repentance if you don't change course. There's no true repentance if you don't change course. If you just keep right on to doing it, you ain't repenting of nothing. You ain't sorry about nothing. You just keep right on going. The third thing we got to do as genuine Christian people is we got to do our best to make amends for the damage we did. Sin damages other people. We don't live in a bubble. And we got to do what we can to make amends for those sins. That's being genuine, that's being honest. That's being honorable um, Christians. You know, we take comfort in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's so true. That's grace, and I'm thankful for it. But grace don't take away the hurt from somebody else. It ain't, because I pray and God forgives me, that don't take away the hurt about what I did to them. I got to go to them, and I got to make it right. We start doing that kind of stuff in churches. We start working in the fields and nurturing green fruit, and start making amends for our problems and our struggles. Church gets a lot more valuable to a lot of people. That's why people don't come to churches. They run into the high priest and the elders when they get here. God help. Verse thirty goes to the second son. And he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he didn't go anywhere. He went not. He appears to be the obedient son. He appears to love his father and obey his commands. He says all the right stuff, but it's just words. That's why James said to love in word and deed. The deed's got to follow the word. In reality, he's disobedient. In reality, he's dishonest. In reality, his word didn't mean nothing. And it didn't change a thing, and it did not pick not one grape. He's still sitting in the house. Verse 31 through 32, and I'll be, I'll be done so we can get on the road. So Jesus tells them this story, and then he turns it around on them to ask them a question. He says, Whether of them twain did the will of the Father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus say unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and you believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward that ye might believe. So he rebukes them. He comes back at them. You know what I find interesting about this question as opposed to the question in the earlier verse? In verse 25? They didn't reason about this one. They didn't consider about this one. They didn't try to figure out what the right answer was about this one because they thought they knew it. And so finally, after all this, we get a little bit of honesty out of them. Just a little bit. And so Jesus shows them 
and shows them who they really are. He points out their hypocrites. He points out their dishonesty. Jesus shows them to be the hypocrites they are. In the eyes of the religious elites, there's no worse sinners than publicans and hypocrites and publicans and harlots. And Jesus said, yeah, they're getting there before you. They're getting there before you. Jesus proclaims the lowest sinners enter the kingdom of God before the high priest and the elders. Our position don't get us nowhere. It don't get us anywhere. And I noticed this about them. Why do you think they got to be the ones? How'd they get to be high priests? How'd they get to be the elders? Because of their pedigree. They were children of Abraham, right? They were the right bloodline. They were Jews of the highest order, and they fell in this right thing. So all of a sudden, that makes them in charge. That makes them the righteous people because they have the right pedigree. They appear to, to, to follow every little part of the law, which we know they don't, but they appear to. Can I just remind us today before I close this up? Paul's faith won't get you in. Your daddy's faith, your daddy's relationship with Christ won't save you. It's a personal, individual experience, a spiritual experience. The Holy Ghost comes, he convicts of you or your sins, leads you to an altar to repent, and Jesus Christ saves you individually, you, between you and him. Papa, don't figure into it. That kind of generational salvation thinking will send you to hell. I don't care how long you've been a member here. I don't care how long your family's been a member here. I don't care if your great, 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 great grandpappy drove the first nail in the first board for the first church. It's not going to save you. You need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I got good news for you. We've seen him saved just not that long ago right here. He's still doing it. He's still in the saving business. So the way I want to close this is this. Each of us, all of us, I don't care when you were baptized. I don't care how long ago you think you were saved, how that experience was. You could be here today and be as secure as can be. I know that I know that I know. I'm in that boat. I don't have any doubt. But 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fail. Every day we need to make sure. Every day we need to check up. Today is a good time to check up. Today is a good time for some self-examination. Today is a good time to be honest about our relationship with Christ. And today is a good time to do something about it. And then let us strive to be genuine in our lives. Let us let's let's don't let's don't be the high priest and the elders. The way I read my Bible, Jesus disliked hypocrites worse than anything in the world. I mean, he was on them all the time. Let's be genuine. If we have sinned and we've been convicted of our sin, deal with it. Deal with it responsibly and genuinely. Repent, change course, and make amends. The Lord loves a repentant heart. So they're going to come play just one verse. They're going to come play just one verse, whatever, whatever it is. I want us to take just a minute where we are to examine ourselves. Maybe there's sin in your life you haven't dealt with yet. Maybe there's a, boy, this gets Baptist churches unnerved. But maybe there's a brother or sister here that there's been a little spat or a problem with. Today's the day to make that right. Y'all go ahead and play.
folks are moving. Don't be left out. Pastor Sean had one request the way we closed the service today, and I'm going to honor that request uh, because he asked me to and because I think it's right. I want all the youth that are going to camp with us and all the adults that are going to come and try to wrangle them to come up front. And I want you to kneel down at this altar. Ain't that a blessing? <laughs> Ain't it a blessing? And he asked that all that were in the sanctuary that were willing to come gather around him. I come with great expectations of what God's going to do with these young people what he's going to do at this camp we're fixing to go to. I know he's able, and I know he's willing, and I know he wants to, and he's going to do some great and mighty things with this group right here, with this group right here. He asks that we pray over him, and let's pray together. I'm going to ask Brother Gary to lead us. Liberty. Young folks to the band.